A while ago, Globebusters uploaded a little video with the title, The Inconvenient Physics. In this video, Chris UK demonstrates a really ham-fisted approach to calculating all the forces that are acting upon an object on the surface of the Earth. And somehow he thinks that he has a zinger which demonstrates that the Earth is not spherical. We will start a few minutes in as you don't really want to deal with all the tedious crap involving someone cornering an astrophysicist and asking out of context questions. So the answers can be misunderstood and used for an entirely different purpose. There may be a few bits which are lengthy. I have sped the bits up where he's not talking, but I've tried to include all the most important talky bits. At the equator, you are revolving around with Earth at a thousand mile an hour. At the same time, you and the Earth are travelling around the Sun at 67,000 miles an hour. The relationship between the two velocities changes as the day progresses. That change is constant. That constant change is ignored by physics when it comes to the globe and space. The physics of you on this rotation, Earth, with Earth moving around the Sun. This physics is called rigid body rotation with translation. First vector, 67,000 mile per hour around the Sun. Vector 2, 1,000 mile per hour as Earth revolves. Resultant vector, adding the two vectors. Repeat for all four positions in 24 hours. All positions have different resultant vector values. At the top it's midday, at the bottom it's midnight. A massive difference in velocities. This is a graphical representation of the two constant velocity vectors. Each movement is 15 degrees of rotation in one hour. See the resultant vector, the red dash line. It changes in length as you rotate with Earth. The increase in velocity is shown here. Acceleration value from point to point here. The increase in velocity from point to point here. The Newton force value for 100 kilograms here. Note, the direction of the acceleration and force changes constantly in relation to you. It's self-evident that this physics is taking place. We are on a rotation that is moving. Go and search for any report, article, calculations that takes account of this physics in relation to you rotating on a globe that is moving around the sun. This shows this change in velocity and describes in any way how it is countered by any force. I don't think you will find one. I've looked. There is plenty of information out there on this, but I will demonstrate that you don't even need this information to be available if you understand trigonometry and extremely basic calculus, as in maths that every A-level student needs to know to come even close to passing their exam. Now, throughout the video, Chris screws up many details such as units, spelling and the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. I won't dwell on these too much, however, funny they are. Now, to avoid being a hypocrite, I will point out that I will not be taking account of the tilt on the Earth in this video as it makes things just a little bit too messy. It's not just about acceleration. It's the forces in play, Newtons, on a mass of 100 kilograms. Using vector addition, we will first work out the acceleration between four points. Two for one hour or 15 degree section. We will then calculate the acceleration between the two points section from 5 till 6 in the morning and a section from 1700 till 1800 hours then add the gravity vectors first calculation resultant velocity at this point 67,000 mile per hour vector and 1000 mile per hour vector addition using the triangle calculator in the description put the angle 105 degrees in then 6700 and 1000 we then get our resultant velocity value repeat for the next position we can now calculate the acceleration. Use the acceleration calculator in the description. Using the acceleration calculator? Really? Are you fucking kidding me? Now, if you are going to try to redefine the laws of physics, which you have to do to claim that the Earth is flat, you should really learn how to do a basic bit of maths. Then find the force value on 100 kilograms. Use the force calculator in the description to get the Newton value. The force calculator. If you need a special calculator to perform this simple computation of multiplying mass by acceleration, then maybe it is time to stop and take a moment to consider whether you have understood this whole physics thing and then subsequently read a book and educate yourself. We get a force value of 3.2 newtons. Now add the gravity vector. On a mass of 100 kilograms, we have 920 newtons. 
again calculate the resultant vector using 1 degree, then 3.2 and 920 for our triangle sides. We have a reduction in force of 3.199 newtons from gravity at 920 newtons due to acceleration. Now repeat the calculations for 1700 hours to 1800 hours. Okay, enough of this nonsense as he can't even Google the correct value for gravitational acceleration. Let's take a look at all the accelerations involved and we consider his diagram. The sun is up here and the tangential velocity of the earth due to its orbit is in this direction. The object's velocity tangent to the earth's surface is given here. Now Chris tries to take the vector sum of these at different times and he divides the difference between the two over the time between the two to get the acceleration. But there are huge problems here and that is that he ignores everything. For an object on the surface of the earth there are two components of motion. Well there are more but their effects are so small that we can ignore them. Firstly we have the orbital motion where the earth orbits the sun once a year. That is 2 pi radians in one year where 2 pi radians is 360 degrees. Now Secondly, we have the rotation from the Earth, which is 2 pi radians every day. So this gives us two frequencies. Firstly, the orbital frequency, which we will denote as omega sub O, and the rotational frequency, which we will denote as omega sub R. We have the corresponding orbital radius denoted with capital R sub O, and the radius of the Earth denoted with capital R sub R. So now we have these, we can start figuring out the accelerations involved. Let's take a disc with radius r and it is rotating at frequency omega. Take a point on the edge, the position of this point is given by these expressions. The velocity is then given by the first derivative of the position with respect to time. And then the acceleration is given by the second derivative of the position with respect to time. Now, as you can see from the diagrams, velocity is perpendicular to the position vector and the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity vector and anti-parallel to the position. This is quite different from what Chris presents. Now, the magnitude of the acceleration is then given by omega squared r. And we can plug in the values for the parameters for the different motions to get the acceleration due to Earth's rotation at the equator. Now this acceleration is directed towards the Earth's axis of rotation. The acceleration due to Earth's orbit is given here. And this is always directed towards the Sun. In this video, there will be a few occasions where I refer to surface normals as well. So I should just quickly describe what this means. A surface normal is a single vector which describes the orientation of a surface at a given point on that surface. The surface normal points directly away from the surface. And for our purposes here, a surface normal on the Earth's surface is always pointing up. Now these accelerations we calculated are all well and good, but we experience all this from a very different reference frame. When we are on the surface of the Earth, we populate a rotating reference frame, and this is not an inertial one due to these accelerations. And this gives rise to inertial forces like centrifugal and Coriolis forces. Think about it as if you are in a car going a roundabout. If you are an observer standing at the center of the roundabout, you would conclude that there is a centripetal acceleration acting on the car, and this acceleration is directed towards the center of the roundabout. But if you are in a car, you experience an acceleration away from the center of the roundabout. Now, this is the centrifugal force, and this is one of those pseudo forces, because they're not really forces but you can treat them as forces, almost like this other phenomenon. Now, treating the surface of the Earth as an inertial reference frame yields these kinds of forces, and these are actually measurable. In the case of the rotation of Earth, this is really quite easy. In our reference frame, the rotation of the Earth results in this centrifugal acceleration, which is perpendicular to the axis of rotation and directed away from it. This centrifugal acceleration is given by omega r squared, multiplied by the distance to the axis of rotation. This distance is given by the product of the equatorial radius of Earth and the cosine of the latitude. 
but we are interested in the apparent weight of an object, which is along a surface normal wherever we are on the Earth. So we have to multiply this again by the cosine of the latitude. Now, if you are lost at this point, just pause the video and take a few moments to consider those diagrams. And this results in things weighing slightly less at the equator than they do at the North Pole. So that's it for how the rotation of the Earth is measurable when considering the forces. Now, there is the acceleration due to our orbit around the Sun, but here is the kicker. The Earth is in free fall around the Sun, and we wouldn't expect to be able to measure any acceleration. Another way of explaining this would be that the acceleration due to gravitational effects between the Earth and the Sun is cancelled out by the centrifugal forces due to the orbit around the Sun. It all depends on what reference frame you are using to perform these calculations. But to wrap up everything so far, the apparent weight of an object on the surface of the Earth is given by the product of mass and the sum of the accelerations due to gravity on Earth and the centrifugal effects due to our rotation. Nothing more. But let's move ahead. What other forces are in play other than gravity? Centrifugal acceleration, sun's gravity, moon's gravity. To have no difference in measured mass at the two points, there must be an equal and opposite force or forces. Centripetal acceleration now the equator is about 0.03 meters per second squared. 03 meters per second squared with a 100 kilogram mass, that's 3 newtons. 3 newtons. The 3 newton force is already accounted for when measuring the mass at this point. Well, you are talking about the centripetal acceleration, but there's the problem. You are in a rotating reference frame and you can't measure this acceleration, but it does give rise to the centrifugal forces that we have already covered. It's that roundabout example. Next, the sun's gravity. Well, this would be the acceleration that an object would experience in a reference frame which is not rotating as stationary with respect to the sun. But that is not the reference frame that we populate. We are in free fall. As we're looking at gravity from the sun, we will have a look at another off-topic problem for the globe. Just for a minute. Place the 100 kilograms at this point, with a measured mass of 100 kilograms at this point, including the sun's gravity. At this point, the measured mass would increase. As the gravity of the sun is pulling the mass to the ground by approximately 0.5 newtons, or 50 grams, due to the sun's gravity pulling up at position 1 and down at 2. At point 1, the mass is actually 60.16 grams heavier than the scale showing, reduced by 60.16 grams due to the sun's gravity. At point 2, the pull of the sun gains approximately 50 grams on the scale for the 100 kilogram mass, plus the 60 grams, and it is not pulling up as at point 1. We have an increased measurement of the mass of 110.16 grams. 110.16 grams gain in 12 hours. Is everything heavier at night? Do we have the technology to measure this? Do we see this? Will we see this at almost any point on the globe? Well, this is a very interesting question. Is everything heavier at night? Now, earlier I said that we are in free fall, and from our reference frame, we could say that the gravitational acceleration due to the sun is cancelled out by the centrifugal acceleration due to our motion around the sun. This is not quite true. And there is a bit of nuance here that we have to consider, and not just for completeness. It is also the reason for some interesting phenomena that we observe, and people have asked me to cover. So previously I said that we are in free fall because the orbital radius is determined by the distance where the centrifugal forces are balanced by the gravitational force. Now this holds at the Earth's centre of mass, but we are not at the Earth's centre of mass. Okay, for the next bit, I'm just going to consider the situation as if we are on the equator and that the Earth has no axial tilt. To adjust for this, you could just multiply by the cosine of the latitude plus the tilt to get the acceleration along the surface normal. So, we are on the surface and we have a net acceleration, which is the sum of the acceleration due to gravity from the Sun and the centrifugal acceleration due to the orbital path. At the center of mass of the Earth, a net is zero. But on the surface, the distances are a bit different, so we need to change the terms a bit. And this is that the distance to the Sun is no longer just the orbital radius, but the orbital radius less the Earth's radius multiplied by the cosine of the orbital frequency multiplied by time. However, this is the acceleration along the axis between the Earth and the Sun, Positive values here are directed away from the sun, and the negative values are towards the sun. 
but it's not actually the force upon a set of scales which is on the surface of the Earth. So we must multiply this by the cosine of the angle between the surface normal and the axis for making up the line between the Earth and the Sun. And now we get the acceleration where positive values now point towards the center of the Earth, make things heavier, and negative values point away from the Earth, making things lighter. And now we see something interesting. At 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. we don't measure any effects due to these motions. Firstly, this is because our surface normal vector is perpendicular to the acceleration vector, but also because at this point you are at a distance from the sun where the gravitational force is cancelled out by the centrifugal force. But here's the interesting bit. At midday, weight is reduced as the acceleration due to the gravity is dominant. At midnight, the weight is reduced as the centrifugal force is dominant. Do we have the technology to measure this? Well, what do we expect to see if all of this is true? We would expect the Earth to bulge a bit. We would expect the oceans to bulge a bit more, almost like tides. And there are many celestial bodies which can affect the tides, but the tides due to this effect should be noticeable. The sinusoidal pattern should have a frequency of 2 oscillations per day. So when we take a Fourier transform of some tidal data, we should see a peak at exactly two per day. Now here is a Fourier transform of 30 years of tidal data from Hinkley Point, and we can clearly see a peak with a frequency of two per day. Now there is a larger peak just below that, and this is due to the tidal effects of the moon. The moon's gravity, a small gravity force, less than the sun on Earth for the 100 kilogram mass. Um, no, the effect due to the moon is actually larger than that of the sun. I refer you to the graph. Well, I think that you get the point. This guy doesn't really understand what is going on. He does continue, but everything I've described so far will address this. It is clear that he doesn't understand the most basic concepts in physics, but at points he does actually come close to being able to see the right ballpark and he is talking about certain effects that we should be seeing if we live on a globe but he neglects to mention that we do actually indeed measure these effects considering that he claims that this information cannot be found on the internet i find it quite funny that everything i have shown here is part of a pretty standard homework assignment you can expect to do in your first year of your physics studies at university but that was it from me. Until next time, don't forget to tune in to my series on Theoria Apophysis and his magnetism nonsense. A quick shout out to my patrons who will be appearing shortly on screen. And thank you all for watching and you'll see me soon.